am I, am I on? The microphone is on, okay. So Samrat, thanks very much for, uh, for the splendid idea of having this meeting, for organizing. It's not on? Should I put further up? But it's, it's up pretty much. Now it's getting better. Okay, now I think it works better. Is it? No? Speak, speak up, put it up further. Where? I can, cannot put it any further up than that. I think that's the maximum. Okay, so Samra, thanks again for the invitation, for putting together this uh, beautiful conference, also for setting the AC in the, in the break so we are no longer freezing. I'll come back to the same topic what uh, Richard and, and uh, Rohit already very nicely introduced, phase separation of proteins. I turn to the practical side, actually the pathological side of, this, uh, of these things, because recently, like a year ago, I started working uh, on phase separation in, in amyotropic lateral sclerosis, which is a terrible disease, and we hope that this phenomenon gives a new hope of, of maybe developing, developing remedies against these things. And the culprit in this case we know very well is a dipeptide repeat, which is encoded by a gene of unknown function. But before I do that, I would go back in time a little bit and give you a little bit of introduction on disordered proteins. Not the whole field because Volodya introduced that very well. But I just sort of cite three or four works that we have published years ago, which turned out, you know, much later, just recently, related to this new field of phase separation. So I, I sort of found out very happily that I, I did contribute to this field. And in, in, in principle, in, in, uh, I mentally prepared for this field you know, for a long time. The first thing I would like to mention that I noticed almost 15 years ago that very often the disordered proteins, IDPs or IUPs at the time, we called them IUPs, have repetitive low complexity regions. And I was contemplating a little bit about what these regions could do once they undergo repeat expansion make this prion-like domains, whatever. I don't want to you know, uh, go into the details, but I do feel that, that with this recent advent of this phase separation field, there is a sort of justification of what these proteins, these highly repetitive, low complexity regions might be doing in a lot of IDPs. The second thing, what Volodya mentioned already, that we have, with Monica, suggested also a couple of years back, that when IDPs function, they very often bind to other things, proteins or RNA or other macromolecules. But very often they don't undergo full uh, disorder to order transition. They do, do not become fully folded. They, they can remain partially or even sort of completely disordered. This is what we call fuzziness. And that's also something that shows back now in this uh, phase separation field. Uh, more recently, we were thinking a little bit about RNA binding proteins because we noticed that RNA binding proteins have a lot of disorder. So we did a little bit of bioinformatic study on comparing let's say, non-RNA non or DNA-binding proteins to DNA-binding proteins to RNA-binding proteins, and we showed formally by bioinformatics that these proteins have a lot of disorder. That, again, connects protein disorder to the phase separation field. And last but not least, I would like to show you happily that a lot of you might know about this database, this prot, that was initiated by Keith about, I think, 15, 20 years ago where he and colleagues collected a lot of uh, biophysical evidence for the, for the existence of disorder in more than a thousand proteins. And because of lack of funding and lack, lack of uh, resources, it sort of slowed down recently, but we have managed to inject new energy into this database with the help of Silvio Tosato in Padova. So the database have been revived, uh, updated and upgraded actually. And if you go there, not only you find a lot of these are the proteins and regions, but you also find functional classification of the proteins. And in this new version, we put in not only prions as functional classes, but also proteins that can phase separate. So this seems to be like a new uh, and upcoming field within the IDP field, but you might as well go the other way that within the phase transition field, people have discovered that there's a lot of disorders. So it's part of the uh, phase transition field. But my talk today will focus on not only, not, not this, but a particular area, which is amyotropic lateral sclerosis. I was contacted about a year ago by, by a group in Leuven. Uh, my place in Brussels belongs to the Flanders Institute of Biotechnology, VIB, and part of that is, is in Leuven at the Leuven University. So that's why the collaboration was established. 
And so they contacted me with, with a problem in ALS. And very briefly, ALS is a motor neuron disease. So either upper or lower motor neurons uh, uh, accumulate a lot of sort of aggregates, inclusions, as they are called, maybe fibrous or non-fibrous amorphous aggregated material. And that's, that's very toxic, apparently, to the cells. So the cells start dying. And because they no longer innervate different muscles, then the muscles also start to de degenerate and eventually we die. ALS is a lethal disease. It's not a very frequent disease. If you look at it, it, it affects only five out of 100,000 individuals. But because it invariably it leads to, to death within three to five years, it is accountable for one out of 500 deaths. If you go to the genetic molecular background of ALS, about 10% of the ALR cases are familial, which means that, that we know that mutation hits one or another gene and its protein product. If you go for the proteins, what they are actually, uh, the, the most famous is superoxide dismutase that was first discovered in this field. But later on, a lot of other proteins, FOS, for example, Rohit was talking about, or TDP43 and the others were discovered. And most of these are RNA binding uh, proteins which have low, low complexity regions, prion-like domains, and almost invariably the mutations identified in familiar cases of ALS hit these low complexity regions. So it really very strongly connects low complexity disordered regions to ALS. But more importantly, it was, rec it was recognized around 2011. There's another type of genetic lesion <coughs> in ALS which is the expansion of a hexanucleotide element in the intronic region of a gene of unknown function. From a normal, let's say, 20 repeats, it can go up to 100 or 1,000 repeats in diseased individuals, and that apparently contributes to the uh, de development of disease. Furthermore, it was formally shown that although this is within an intronic region of a, a gene of unknown function, it gets translated. It should not be translated because it's an intron, but it's not spliced out, it's translated in all six frames. So it's very difficult to conceive, but it, that's what happens. So that, that gives rise to the formation of five different dipeptide repeats, such as proline, arginine, N. The N can be anything between 20 to 1,000. We don't really know, you know how long the actual peptides are in the cells of these individuals. But this contributes to disease, it was formally shown. It can have three different mechanisms. It can cause a loss of function of the original gene product, the protein, so this whole protein. It probably doesn't happen. Maybe it's lost, but, but it doesn't contribute to the disease. Or maybe this long extended intronic region can have a gain of function because of the RNA, you know, doing something bad in the cell. Or it could be the peptides, the dipeptide repeats that form in the cell that can be very toxic. By my our, our collaborators, it was formally shown that the dipeptide repeats actually are very toxic. For example, in Drosophila, when the different DPRs were overexpressed, it was shown that the arginine-rich ones, so the proline arginine and, and, and glycine arginine N, 20, 30, 50, or 100, shortens the life expectancy of Drosophila a lot, both females and males. And when the expression was directed in particular cell types, such as in the, in the eyes, and it, it was shown that it's really very toxic. It has very bad consequences, especially if the PR is overexpressed. So the dipeptide repeats are very toxic, for sure. They kill cells. They can kill whole organisms. And they were, they were shown to do something else. By just serendipitous you know, experimentation with, with them, it was shown that they, they undergo phase separation. So that's a solution of, for the DPR. I think it's PR 20 or 30 at high temperature in the presence of polyethylene glycol. So a little crowding is added to help the phase separation. Nothing happens, but if you cool down the, cool down the solution to four degrees, then the solution becomes opaque. And under microscope, you can see small droplets. These are apparently liquid-like liquid, liquid -like or liquid droplets, as we have formally shown. They, they show many features of liquids. For example, they are completely reversible. So if, if you heat the sample again, going back to 25 degrees, they disappear. Or under shearing, they change shape from a spherical to you know, some distorted shape. But upon the cessation of the shearing force, they regain this uh, completely spherical shape. And they can fuse together like little droplets. So that was, a, that was the reason we started, sort of, we, we decided to characterize this at the molecular detail. And uh, we, we will be looking for answering the following four questions. What are the molecular determinants of this liquid-liquid phase separation of, uh, of dipeptide repeats?
What is the di dynamics? And is there any structural disorder within this, uh, this di repeat do liquid droplets? Do they bind other proteins in cells or cell extracts? And do they affect something that is really related to the development of the, di of the disease, which is stress granule dynamics? And Rohit already talked about stress granules, so I don't want to introduce them. Uh, to approach the first thing, the first question, we have shown that, um, that there are very strict determinants of this liquid-liquid phase separation. For example, crowding. If you, if you applied polyethylene and glycol at different concentrations, the higher we went, the more apparent the phase separation was. Apparently, crowding really pushes molecules together, make them phase separate. And longer repeats were better than shorter repeats. So DPR, which is PR30, was better than 20. We couldn't go higher because uh, chemically, the chemists could not synthesize it and we could not express uh, longer uh, PR repeats in, in E. coli cells because they are very toxic. I talked to Richard on the way here and he suggested that, that they have longer repeats. So I would be really very interested in finding out how one can make longer repeats in, in vitro, in a purified peptide form. Further, further down on this determinants of PS question, we have shown that the counter ions really matter a lot. I think it's not, not surprising after having listened to a couple of talks on this subject. For example, phosphate is much better than carbonate and it's much better than chloride when measured with the turbidity of the solution. Apparently our model at that, at that moment when we saw it was that there are electrostatic interactions, so the network that makes you know, the phase separation is formed between uh, charges of uh, opposite charges. But as comparison to even phosphate, something RNA is a, a polymeric uh, uh, L polyelectrolyte is even better. We modeled it with poly U, so this is not a real RNA, it's not a sequence specific phenomenon apparently at this level. A poly, poly U do, does it just as well as any other uh, RNA. But we could show that, so the poly U brings down the, uh, these DPRs into the droplets, even in the absence of, of uh, crowding. So we, we could leave out polyethylene glycol. Apparently the network forms much better between two polymeric substrates. And we also suspected maybe other types of, of interactions that cation pi, or so as electrostatic could contribute to phase separation. So we also tried polytyrosine in this system. And we could see some transition, not to, not to the same droplets, but a more aggregated state. But there are apparently poly, uh, cation pi interactions besides electrostatic interactions take part in this phenomenon. We could show formally that these droplets are really liquid-like and very dynamic by several rounds of experiments. <clears throat> this is a formal evidence that PR peptides and poly U co-localize in the droplets. So they form the droplets together, they don't segregate like a protein in one droplet and the RNA into the, into the other. And by dynamic light scattering, which we could show that the droplets are very dynamic. So they grow in size uh, over time. And then we add extra RNA, they just drop in size, grow again and drop again, and then grow. And we, our interpretation was that this growing occurs due to uh, Oswald ripening because droplets of different size have, have different uh, surface tension and the bigger droplets win over smaller ones and they, they grow in size. We also did fluorescence recovery after photobleaching experiment to show that not only they are very dynamic, they exchange protein very actively within the droplet itself and with the environment. So we bleached the fluorescence of the, of the peptide, labeled peptide, and then and they just observed that over time it recovers. That's the recovery kinetic. So within a minute, let's say fluorescence returns into the droplet. And if you leave it sort of uh, mature a little bit for 24 hours, this dynamics of the droplet doesn't really change much. It's, it was important to try it out because a prevailing model in the field is that following phase separation and maybe gelation, the, these proteins undergo a transition to an aggregated state. So they, it's sort of the pre-state of, of amyloid formation. And the real culprit in the disease in ALS, I should be there are a lot of aggregates, a lot of inclusions, maybe is amyloid formation of these uh, proteins. But we don't see any sign of this, neither when we put it under the electron microscope. This is just, I think, uh, uh, the network that holds the sample. We don't see any fibers in the droplets, even after one hour. Then we try to look into the, into the droplets and look whether the protein remains fuzzy, disordered. I mean, the dipeptide repeats remain disordered. Within the droplet, we 
with two techniques we couldn't show it. One was CD spectroscopy. Initially we thought that we see something of a positive sign, but then we realized we don't. What happens here is that the, the peptide itself in isolation has a very nice spectrum that suggests it's disordered. But when we titrate it with RNA, RNA, sorry, RNA it became smaller and smaller and, and eventually the, the spectrum completely disappeared. So that told us that what we see actually is, you know, the space in between the droplets and the droplets which enrich the protein uh, have such a high absorption that we, we cannot uh, look into them. The same apparently or similar thing apparently happens with NMR. So for example, if this is just a one dimensional spectrum, but the NMR expert told that if you don't see anything in, in one dimension, it's not worth looking into more uh, higher dimensionalities. But what you can see here is that this one dimensional spectrum of the droplets was the same as they are super natant after centrifuging them out. So apparently what we saw by NMR was coming entirely from the super natant of the droplets and not within the droplets. Maybe they have too high viscosity you know, to, to show up on the NMR. With two other techniques, we could, however, show at a low resolution at least that uh, the dipeptide repeats might be disordered in the droplets. One was uh, fluorescence and isotropy. Very briefly, the peptide is labeled and we shine, uh, fluores uh, we shine light on it. That is, uh, uh, in two different dimensions, uh, polarized. And then we measure the sort of polarity of the, of the emitted fluorescent light. And it's, it's known that if the, if the protein or the label moves very fast, then the, then the measured anisotope is very low. Whereas if, if it sort of freezes or slows down in movement, the uh, anisotope might go up. And what we see that the free peptide has a very low anisotropy, but even after formation of the droplets, it doesn't reach or approach the limiting uh, value of anisotropies that would have been observed for a very slowly tumbling protein. So that, that's a suggestion that the protein probably is, is largely disordered in the droplets. Another technique, HD exchange, also showed similar things. Here, very briefly, we dilute the solution of the protein into heavy water, and on my mass, mass pack, we measure how many of the protons, or the mobile protons, have, have been exchanged to, to heavy protons, deuterium. And what you can see here, that we measured it over time, but even in time, in the first time point after five seconds, all the protons of, of the free peptide has been or have been replaced by heavy uh, protons. So apparently the, the dipeptide repeats is very, is very disordered. All the, all the amide protons and other protons on the arginines are freely accessible. Now we did a similar experiment with the droplets. So we made the droplets and we diluted it, them under conditions when they do not dissolve. So it was really worked out. And what you can see that most of the protons, even under these conditions, are very rapidly replaced. Not all of them, the number is a little different from here. So, so the exchange is not 100%, just 80%. But it shows that 80% of the protons are, are accessible and occur in a locally disordered environment, whereas maybe 20% of them take part in somehow binding the RNA or so they are involved in, in hydrogen bonds or something else. Then we went further on, closer, moved closer to the disease. We looked into what other proteins these uh, dipeptide repeats might bind to. And either without or with cross-linking, we pulled down the dipeptide repeat droplets and their associated proteins from cell extracts. And by mass spec, we identified several hundred actually proteins. So that's the interactome of PR30 at this moment. You probably cannot read it, but there is a very definite you know, enrichment in this, uh, in this interactome for RNA processing proteins, so uh, RNA proteins such as RNA stability, splicing, and so on, proteins or ribosomal proteins, and also protein processing uh, uh, other proteins such, such as chaperones and so on. When we look at the overlap of, of our, our interactome, proteome, PR, it, it very highly significantly overlaps with stress granule proteins and nucleolar proteins, so other other membraneless organelles that are also called, uh, uh, that also form in, uh, with RNA. And when we analyze the sequences, we saw that RNA binding domains are highly significantly enriched in our proteins. So most of particular RNA binding domains are enriched. They are also enriched in protein disorder. So the interactome of PR30 <coughs> is more disordered than the general uh, proteome of, of these human cells. And last but not least, not least, these proteins could formally also shown by, by bioinformatic predictions to be supersaturated. 
we heard from Chris Dobson about that there's a measure of you know, how happy a protein under given uh, conditions in a cell are. And it seems that the interactome of, of these uh, dipeptide repeats are super, tend to be super saturated proteins. Then we went to live cells to see what this dipeptide repeat overexpression does in the cell. And what we found for the first, uh, first observation that, that the dipeptide repeats, which are tagged in this case, co-localize with a marker that is a very well-known marker for stress granules. So basically, the dipeptide repeats tend to localize into stress granules. But they do more than that. They, they don't just simply move into the stress granules that form upon stress, but they sort of promote or aggravate the formation of stress granules. For example, we show that PR repeat is much better in, in making cells with, with uh, stress granules than PA repeat, which is not toxic, if you remember. Or if, if we provoke the cells with arsenate, which is a known agent for, for making stress granules in the cell, it really cooperated with PR. So when we applied the two stresses together, the, the level of stress granules and the number of cells with stress granules was, uh, was much higher. Uh, besides, when we knocked out two factors from the cell that, that are known to contribute to stress granule formation, one is a protein that's GRBP, or the other is mutation of this initiation factor 2A, which is known for, for stress granule, normal stress. Is it coming from me? Should I step back? No. It's OK. So if you make mutations of this factor, then the number of cells with stress granules very significantly drop. So it's clear that the dipeptide repeats sort of have something to do with the, with the stress granule formation. Besides, if we analyze the stress granules that were, that were formed with and without the dipeptide repeats, it was pretty clear that certain proteins which are involved in, in ALS, so the disease, are highly significantly enriched. In particular, one, the most famous protein actually in the ALS business, this TDP, TAR DNA binding protein 43, it's very highly significantly enriched in the stress granules formed in the presence of DPRs. If you read the ALS literature, you know, the number one marker of ALS inclusions is highly ubiquitinated TDP 43 protein. So it, it, it has a tendency to aggregate, to get ubiquitinated, it fails to be degraded, and that forms you know, the inclusions. Because of this observation that, you know, the stress granule formation, we have come back a little bit to in vitro studies to show that uh, maybe we can see some signs of, of sort of aggregation occurring in, in, uh, in phase separation or following phase separation. So what we did here is we, we took FAS, the protein uh, Rohit mentioned, the low complexity region, and we let it form, you know, uh, liquid droplets. And then we measured the size of the droplets. And apparently, they were very dynamic. They, they grew in size, just like I showed with dipeptide repeat. But when we added the PR30, the DPR, that they, they no longer grew in size. So they became very sort of rigid. They failed to be as dynamic as without. I, if you remember, I showed that DPR itself is very dynamic as a droplet. FAS itself is dynamic. But when the two proteins together were in, the, in these droplets, they, they ceased to be that dynamic. And last but not least, uh, by thioflavin T uh, staining, we also showed that something happens within the droplets that looks like amyloid. We did not formally show by electron microscopy or anything, but the thioflavin T fluorescence uh, signal showed that when, when we, make the two, we mix the two proteins together and let the droplets form, then, it, then it, over time something happens in the droplets that is very fluorescent in the presence of THD. So apparently we have See, we have seen signs, I would say, that if DPR30 is highly overexpressed in cells, I'm almost there, good. Then, then something happens, so they, they do mature into a state which is thioflavin T positive, so there might be aggregated fibrillar material in those. So that's almost the end of my story. I would like to just you know, outline of the major conclusions that we could draw from this ongoing study, so we are continuing. It's pretty clear that arginine-enriched DPRs undergo liquid-liquid phase separation, especially when RNA is present. The DPRs interact with many, many other uh, ribonucleoprotein granule-specific proteins that are linked to disease very often as well. The dipeptide repeats perturb stress granule formation dynamics. I would stress that stress granule formation dynamics is a normal process in the cell, right? So the formation and dissolution of stress granules is a normal part of the cellular life. But this is somehow perturbed by the presence of DPRs. And last, last but not least, 
They promote the aggregation, it seems, aggregation of ALS-related proteins which have prion-like domains. And that's the end of my story. I would just mention a few people who contributed to this. From my group in Brussels, it was Dennis and Meinak. Meinak Kata, and a very uh, fine bioinformatician, so he did most of the analysis. Whereas from, from uh, the Catholic University Leuven, it was Steven, Elk, and Ludo who, who did the job, and there are many other groups also in the US have been involved, and we were very happy and proud that this whole story appeared on the cover of Molecular Cell in March 16, 2017, which was just two days after my birthday. So it was like a birthday present to me. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Peter. We have time for questions. Richard? So Peter, what, uh, what knowledge do you have about the actual lengths of the DPRs in intoxicated cells of ALS patients? I know that this is, uh, th there's relatively little information, but I wonder what insights you and your team might have into the actual profile of lengths in vivo. So I, I talked a lot about to, to medical people who really know, you know, the patient things and then try to analyze by mass spec what is, what is in there. It's very difficult, actually, because of the highly repetitive nature. By mass spec, you, you, you cut it up, you know, and you cannot put, put back together how long the DPR was. You recognize there are elements of it, but you cannot tell. So they, they cannot, I think at the moment, nobody can tell how long this RAN translation might go. I think the 2030 that we could uh, physically apply is a very, very short version. So there might be much longer DPRs in, in disease itself. We have actually a project addressing this question. We are trying to analyze, you know, patient material and then find it out. Uh, hi, Peter. Uh, here. Uh, so uh, ah, yes. last you showed there are some thioflavinsky studies for the amylet formation, but do you know whether they're inside the droplet or outside the droplet? If you just put two different proteins, they might separately form amyloid. So is it influenced by the droplet or not? And the second question is like, you showed the dipeptide repeats, they have influence for phase separation. So whether they're sensitive to a sequential Rx, Rx, or it could be random Rx, X, R, Rx, or it's just mainly reach of the arginines. I'm, I'm not sure I completely follow. So the question was, where does this THT positive fibrillar material appear, whether within droplets or outside or on the surface of the droplets, right? We could, we could not, actually didn't try to resolve that, you know, spatially. So we have no idea. But we would expect, I would expect personally that it's, it's within the droplets. From the logic of what Rohit has presented, in the droplets you really, you really concentrate the proteins, right? So it's really a hotbed for, for further aggregation. So I think the current model also, but I'm not sure who showed, maybe it was Richard who showed that. So the, you go from solution to, a, to, to the phase separated state to the aggregation. Everybody assumes that the phase and the aggregation, the fiber formation occurs within the droplets. But within the droplets, the frame trap measurements show they are quite dynamic. But if they form semi-light, then it's not expected that they will be very dynamic, right? Can you repeat it again? Uh, so the FRAP measurement showed that the inside the droplets, things are very dynamic. Ah, okay. But if they are forming amyloids, then they are not expected to be very dynamic. Is it or I'm wrong? Ah, okay. Yes, that's very good. So actually, there are two types of FRAP, FRAP experiments. I didn't show both. One is that we extinguish the fluorescence in, in the entire droplet and so that it exchanges with the environment, right? So that's one kind of dynamics. The other is that we just, you know, shine light on a on a particular line, and we show that within the droplet there is a very active exchange of proteins. If, if there, were, there were fiber formation of aggregate formation, I think it would, it would stop, you know, to, for, to happen. So we would, we would shine the laser light on it, we would ex extinguish the fluorescence, and that would be it, you know, it would stay like that. Although I recall from a completely sort of independent memory I have about uh, I'm not sure who that was who studied fibers, amyloid fibers, and it was shown for me that even amyloid fibers are quite dynamic creatures, right? They grow, they can grow and shrink, and they exchange material with the environment. But I think that, that might be much, much slower than the exchange with this, within, the, within and with these liquid droplets, I think. Any other questions? Peter, let me ask you, how rapidly does protein exchange, but to the, the PR repeat exchange between the medium and the droplet? So what we see is the recovery in the FRAP experiments is within a minute, I would say. 
So the half-life is like 20, 30 seconds. So that, that's, uh, I think you have to take into consideration also the viscosity of the droplet and the concentrations and things like that. Yeah. So it's, I would it's say it's fast. quite fast. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I don't see any other questions, so uh, let's thank Peter and also Rohit for a very interesting morning. I thank all the chairs and speakers. Uh, so right after lunch, uh, the poster session starts, and we'll come back here for the Amelard session at 4 o'clock.